For bead stringers and pearl stringers, showing their work in galleries is a wonderful way of earning money, enhancing their reputations, and developing credentials for increased exposure. My name is Fleury Summers and I owned a gallery for more than 10 years. I know that artisans can be timid about approaching galleries, but they needn't be. Here are 10 tips for approaching and working with galleries. First, understand what you're selling. As a bead and pearl stringer, you're creating one-of-a-kind jewelry, not commercial jewelry. This one-of-a-kind jewelry is called studio jewelry or art jewelry. The term studio jewelry originated when veterans returning from World War II worked alone in their garages and studios producing one-of-a-kind or limited production jewelry. Also, it's important to know your materials and be able to explain them. As a gallery owner, I was often astonished when artists showed me work and did not know the gemstones used in it. Ask the dealers about the materials research them online, and then be prepared to discuss them. Similarly, know if the material has been treated and what the treatment is. Most, although not all, gemstones are treated in some way. Amber is reconstituted, pearls are dyed or irradiated, gemstones are heat treated. This is only a negative if you don't know what the treatment is and can't discuss it with the gallery owner. This is not to suggest you need to be a gemologist to show your work to gallery owners, and most don't want to be burdened with too much information. But in order to sell, the gallery owner must have some product information, and you'd be surprised how often artisans overlook this important point. Second, deal with the gallery owner yourself. When I was running a gallery, it was not uncommon for a spouse, significant other, or, quote, manager, unquote, to approach me about representing an artist. Assuming the artist isn't producing thousands of pieces, in other words, producing commercial jewelry, these arrangements usually develop as a result of the artist's timidity about marketing. This is totally understandable, but to be blunt, get over it. In purely practical terms, you're almost undoubtedly not going to make enough sales through one gallery to justify the intermediary, and most gallery owners will not represent artists who show in multiple galleries in their area. More important, gallery owners are used to dealing with artists directly and will resent a third person. In the decade that I ran a gallery, the only time I dealt with an intermediary was when I represented a Russian artist who could not speak English. In that case, I communicated very cordially with her through her husband. Third, do not show work you're not prepared to sell. Showing the gallery owner a beautiful piece of work and then announcing that the work is not for sale wastes his time and yours. Moreover, it brands you as unprofessional. Think about it for a minute. Why on earth would you signal to a gallery owner that the only pieces available for sale are second best? Similarly, don't wear not-for-sale jewelry to openings. Prospective clients are usually interested in what the jewelry artist is wearing. Remember, you're actually modeling your jewelry, enabling a prospective client to visualize how the jewelry looks when it's being worn. If that gorgeous necklace is not for sale, buyers will be irritated and you will be responsible for killing sales. So wear jewelry that is similar to the work being shown. All of us keep some work back. After all, we make jewelry because we love it. But use some common sense about when you show or wear pieces that are not for sale. Four, understand the gallery sales process. Most galleries work on a consignment basis. Rarely will a gallery owner buy work, especially from an unknown artist. As part of the consignment arrangement, galleries typically take between 40 and 50 percent of the retail sales price, and this is frequently a matter of outrage to artists, especially beginners, who believe the gallery is somehow ripping them off. There's a very simple way to avoid this. Focus on what you need from the sale, not what the gallery owner will take from it. For example, if you're selling a necklace and you need $150 to cover your costs and make a profit, 
set the retail price at 300 If the gallery owner suggests the price is too high, be prepared to discuss why it's justified. Alternatively, when you can sign the jewelry, simply provide a wholesale price for it and let the gallery owner set the retail price. When you can sign work, be sure to have two copies of an inventory list with product descriptions and prices that are identified as wholesale or retail. You and the gallery owner should sign both copies and date them. Your copy of your inventory and pricing list is for your protection. 5. Understand notification and payment policies. Before consigning your work, develop an understanding of how you'll be notified of sales and when you'll be paid. Unfortunately, many galleries pay on a 60 to 90 day basis and many of them are casual about notifying the artist if the piece has been sold. In the majority of cases, this is not because the owner is dishonest. It's because their business practices are a little casual. So if the gallery owner doesn't volunteer information about their sales and notification practices, just ask. If the gallery is slow in paying you, you'll have to make the determination of whether it's more important to have the credential of showing your work in that gallery or withdrawing your work. Six, determine if your work is a good fit. Visit a gallery before approaching a gallery owner. Take a look at the kind of work he or she is selling and decide whether your work is a good fit. The number of craft galleries has exploded in recent years, so there is probably a venue for your work in your area. Don't overlook artist co-ops and fine art galleries either. Artist co-ops can be an excellent way of getting your work seen. In addition, I've recently visited a number of fine art galleries featuring small jewelry displays. 7. Determine how the gallery looks at work. Some galleries have strict processes for viewing new work. These galleries want to see pictures and biographies before meeting with the artist. Other galleries aren't as formal. A call to the gallery can determine how the owner prefers to view new work. If the owner responds that he or she is not taking on new work at the moment, ask if you can send pictures of your work anyway for their files. Most gallery owners will not object to this, although they may be discouraging. Remember that the gallery owner is in the business because he or she loves the work they show, and most gallery owners have extensive backgrounds in their specialities. This means they have a broad and deep interest in the work they show. So be polite, but be persistent. 8. Managing a drop-in visit. If you do decide to visit a gallery unannounced, be careful about your timing. Galleries get most of their traffic on weekends. Openings are important sales events for galleries. In my experience, the best time to visit a gallery is early in the week and early in the day. This is generally when there is the least traffic and when the gallery owner may have time to meet with you. If he or she is with the client, wait. Do not interrupt what could be a potential sale. 9. Materials you'll need. However you approach a gallery owner, you'll need certain basic materials. If you send them pictures of your work, obviously you'll need high quality photos. In addition, you'll need a biography. This can be a two or three paragraph description of your background, where you've studied, and with whom. Or it can be a detailed listing of shows you've been in, schools attended, etc. You'll also need an artist's statement. Many artists regard these as a nuisance, but they're an important selling tool. Artist statements can give important insights into your work, your inspirations, your techniques, etc. They should be substantive and thoughtful but can also include formative information. For example, if you grew up in or visited a place that inspired you, if you were a second or third generation artisan, if this is a second career for you, etc. 10. Work with the gallery owner. The top national and international artists I've represented all understood the sales process and were extremely helpful in providing suggestions and materials that help support their work. 
This means working with the gallery owner. Volunteer any articles that may have appeared about you or any articles you might have written. If you have a list of friends and contacts, supply them to the gallery owner for openings. Ask what pictures they need for cards or for their website and have them available. If you're comfortable doing so, volunteer to give a gallery talk. Be sure to attend openings and however shy you might be, make the effort to mingle. I've actually had artists or friends of artists volunteer to supply food and wine for openings. The point is to remember that you and the gallery owner have the same objective and that is selling your work. Don't be passive about the sales process. Work with the gallery owner. It's to your benefit. Here are some final thoughts. The one point not mentioned above is implied. That is, you must know your pearl and bead stringing techniques and develop work that is solidly constructive and long-lived. This means knowing manufacturing materials and the potential trade-offs between manufacture and design. If you have any questions about these, please visit my website for the comprehensive Professional Pearl and Bead Stringing two-volume DVD course, also available at Amazon.com. You may also email me at flurry at fsummers.com. Using the techniques of pearl and bead stringing can be the basis for gallery-worthy, beautiful, and unique designs. You will not get rich showing in a gallery, but you will begin to re develop a reputation that can be leveraged into other sales venues.